to go ahead and get started. Uh, so we'll see how much uh, how much we're able to get covered. We still have what a, a good bit of material left, so I might try to go a little bit faster uh, at places. Please still feel free to stop me and ask questions uh, if you have any. So where we left off, um, we had just uh, talked about these uh, packages, HDF5 array and Matter, that let us use a essentially a file-based backend for working with large matrices in R. So now we're going to actually try a few examples to show you how easy these tend to these are to work with. All right. So firstly, um, most file-based backends like this uh, have some additional limitations on what kind of data they can represent. Um, so you can imagine while you're working with data within R, um, it's very flexible. You can essentially put the data in whatever format you want. We have our custom S4 class mass spectrum objects. Going into a file, you have a little bit more limitations than that. Um, most of them expect some sort of uh, matrix-like object that will all need to be one data type. So we can't really use our mass spectrum objects directly. Uh, in our case, the spectra that we simulated all have the same MZ values, so we can just turn our intensities into a matrix where essentially every column of this matrix is a different mass spectrum, or at least the intensities for a mass spectrum. Um, and then we can use this matrix uh, as a seed to create our HDF5 array or, or, or our matter matrix. So here I'm just going to um, use uh, LApply to extract the intensities from every mass spectrum in this uh, spectra object. So remember spectra here, this is just a mass spectra, length, uh, mass spectra list of length 500. So I'm going to extract the intensities from them using the intensity method. Remember, I have a method for extracting the intensities from a mass spectrum object. I would call it like so just grabs the intensities from the mass spectrum. So I'm going to apply uh, L apply intensity to all of the spectra. I'm going to use this uh, function simplify to array uh, to turn this list of intensities into a matrix. Um, I could also just uh, like uh, uh, C bind them together or something like that. Uh, simplify to array is just a simple function that does this for me. It's actually what gets called internally if you uh, S apply to do something instead of L apply. So that's all that that's doing, and now I have a matrix of intensities. Um, not quite large enough on its own to warrant the need to use this approach, uh, but it's fine for our examples in this case, so that I can actually run this stuff and still have time to get to our next set of material. Okay, so to create an HDF5 array, all I need to do is uh, load the HDF5 array library. Um, I need to get this matrix of intensities into an HDF5 file. So the function that I use to do that is this function write HDF5 array, which takes at least the arguments uh, some sort of matrix or matrix-like object, give it my matrix of intensities a file path where I want to store the HDF5 file that they're going to be written to, and a name of the object within the HDF5 file. So an HDF5 uh, file can actually contain multiple objects, um, so you can have different kinds of uh, data sets within an HDF5 file. So I need to give it a name to identify this particular object within the HDF5 file, even though I'm just storing a single matrix. I could potentially store additional things inside this same file. So I'm going to load HDF5 array. I'll run write HDF5 array. It takes just a second, and you can see I now have a file uh, called intensities.h5 uh, here in my working directory. And if I just uh, type intensity underscore h5, which is the name of the variable that I assigned this to, uh, well, firstly, write HDF5 array. So this will return a new HDF5 array, or in this case, an HDF5 matrix object. So I assign this to a variable called intensity h5. And if I just print that, you can see that 
It doesn't want to access the entire matrix um, and print all of, all of that to you. It wants to give you a little bit of information though, so it just prints the uh, four corners of this matrix. So the first uh, five rows and the last five rows and the first three columns and the last uh, two columns that appears. So we can access the columns of an HDF5 matrix like this, just like we would any sort of R matrix. So if I just index, say, the first column here, oh, this actually corresponds to all of the intensities for my first mass spectrum. And you can see when I access it like this, it just pulls those intensities into memory from the HDF5 file, and it returns to them to me as an ordinary uh, numeric vector. So I could like, I'm just going to plot these real quick, uh, verify that they still look something like a mass spectrum. That looks reasonable. So I'm gonna, going to assume my data was written correctly. I seem to be able to access it and it still looks like a mass spectrum. Uh, I'm not, not going to look at the other 499 of these. So with an HDF5 array object, if I just uh, select one row or one column, it will return those to me. That it will return that to me as an R numeric vector. If I try to uh, subset some sort of smaller bit of it, uh, some smaller bit of it, it'll actually return to me a new delayed matrix object uh, with that particular subset. And this just essentially has instructions for say. Um, here's a new object, it's going to be a subset of this original matrix. Um, it's not actually going to grab the intensities until I need them. Uh, in this case, it's small enough that my print method will end up showing me all of them anyway. So that's how, uh, how this HDF5 matrix thing works. So what I can do now is I can use this in BPL apply. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to iterate over the indices of the columns of this matrix. So I'm just going to create a sequence one through the number of columns in this matrix. I'm going to give it a function where the arguments are firstly that index, and then I'm going to give it arguments for the uh, intensities and the MZ values. Remember, I'm doing it this way because if I use, say, for example, a snow backend, um, the worker processes won't have access to this intensity H5 object that I just created um, unless I pass them as parameters to this function that I'm giving to BPL apply. So I'm giving that matrix as one of the arguments, and I'm also giving the MZ values. In our case, all of these vectors share the same MZ values, so I can just grab the first one from the first spectrum. I'm going to make sure that MS example and HDF5 array are loaded on the workers. I'm going to extract the first column from my HDF5 array matrix. Um, and I'm going to create a new mass spectrum that my processing methods will know how to handle. And I'm going to smooth the noise, remove the baseline, and find the peaks, and return that. Run this. Now in our case, this matrix is small enough to easily fit into memory. There's no real reason in this particular case to write it out to a file and do it this way, because the I.O. of reading it from disk, will, or reading it from file, will take quite a bit longer than just if I did this in memory. Uh, but if this were a much larger data set, then doing it like this would be much, much more memory efficient uh, than trying to do this on the entire matrix in memory. Uh, yes. My initial chunk of data is larger than I can actually get into memory. Can you bring in chunks and then append all of these to an H5 array, or what is what is that going to work look like? Right. So in this case, I had the data in memory initially, and I wrote that to an HDF5 array. Um, of course, in lots of cases, you won't want to do that. that do that, and you'll instead want to uh, say create an HDF5 array and then read one spectrum for several ten or hundreds, however many spectra at a time, write those to that array um, and do that so you're not loading in everything into memory at once. And you, yeah, yeah, you can do that. So that would be the way that um, I would do this if my data were very large. 
So at this point, I'm mostly showing how we would actually work with this kind of object once we actually have it. Um, there are, you can imagine several different paths where we might get to this point. Um, in our case, we just had it in memory and wrote it to a file. Um, some Potentially, someone might have already saved it to an HDFI file, in which case we can just access it using this, or we might uh, create an initial HDFI file with some sort of uh, matrix and fill in the columns with mass spectra by reading those mass spectra one at a time. And I believe MSN Base already has some sort of on disk backend for doing stuff like this. I'm, I'm not sure if it uses HDFI for this uh, or not. Uh, Cardinal. My package for mass spec imaging uses um, Matter as its backend since we're prim I'm primarily working with IMZ and L files. So we finished. Uh, at some point while I was talking, uh, I'm going to go ahead and plot the, flirt, the first uh, result, which should be a processed mass spectrum that has some peaks. Uh, those look uh, like some results that I might expect. expect. So that seemed to have worked. Again, in this case, it's small enough that the file-based I.O. was made it slower. But if this, this were very large, then we would much prefer uh, that than trying to load everything then into memory and, um, and all of the difficulties that that would entail. It would be much slower that way. So this is much, this is much more memory efficient, which is what we want. Right, any questions on this HDF5 array thing? Uh, this is from so this is from the core some of the core bioconductor people so it should be pretty well documented and well supported in bioconductor now. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about matter. So matter follows kind of some of the same basic principles. Here I'm just going to uh, main difference is it doesn't use this HDF5 doesn't use this HDF5 file format. It just uses flat binary files. And internally, uh, Matter creates objects that have some sort of metadata information on where the different rows and columns are stored within those files. And if you're an advanced user, you can specify exactly um, where those are, where you, where you expect your spectra or your rows and columns to be coming from. In this case, I'm just going to load Matter and just use as.matter to force this to a matter matrix, which will automatically write it to some temporary file. And that's pretty quick. So now if I print my intensity mat, I can see this is an object of class matter mat C. So that means it's a matter matrix. Um, the C tells us it's a column major matter matrix. So accessing the columns should be very fast. Accessing the rows would be a little bit slower. Um, our columns are the mass spectra, so that's what we want. Uh, we want to be able to access the columns really quickly, so that's perfect for us. Um, it gives you, uh, by default, matter won't print out any of the values. It'll wait for you to request them. It just prints out a short summary of um, the size of the matrix, the number of uh, files. That's what this source is, is it's the number of files that are uh, that this matrix is composed of, uh, the data mode, which is numeric, um, and a little bit of information about how much memory this, uh, this object is taking in real memory and how much object is being taken up in the file. So again, just like with the HDF5 array, we can index into a matter matrix. If I just index the first column, it will return it to me as an R vector. Uh, one difference is that if I extract some subset of the matter matrix, it will return that to me as an R matrix. If I want to instead subset this and return a new matter matrix, I have it set up so you use drop equals null to do that. And that will return, in this case, a five row and five column matter matrix. So the way that I would use this in uh, BPL apply now is basically the same way that I did before. So I'm just going to iterate over its columns or an index into its columns and passing this uh, matter matrix uh, to BPL apply as well as the NZ values, creating a new mass spectrum object from the corresponding columns, doing some processing, and assigning this to some results. I believe at some point 
I had registered a multi-core for an M back in. I'm not sure if I still have that registered right now. So uh, that was pretty quick. Uh, again, part of the idea here is that um, this intensity mat, and uh, the same is true of the HDF5 uh, matrix, uh, the actual R objects are very, very small. They're just the metadata telling us what file we're getting this stuff from and where in the file to look. So passing this to the additional R sessions should be very quick and reduce the overhead of doing this in parallel. Otherwise, it's pretty simple. Uh, any questions on this part? Okay. All right, so something else I want to think about is what if we can't actually represent our spectra as an ordinary matrix? Um, what if our, spec our spectra are of different lengths or have different MZ values? That seems like a very realistic situation that we might have. Um, so if we have spectra that are of different lengths with different MZ values, we can't just easily turn that into a matrix. So we have to think about what we would do in that situation. In that situation, we can't use HDF5 array because we need to represent something as a matrix in that case. Um, here I'm going to simulate some new spectra that are of different lengths. Um, I'm only uh, simulating 100 this time. We can see the lengths of these mass spectra. The first one has 4,177 data points. The next one has 3,250 data points. And we can see that they have different MZ values. So if I just tried to turn this into a matrix, well, firstly, I couldn't do it, and we'd have to decide exactly how we want to do that. So one advantage of matter is I uh, designed it to be flexible for situations like this, since it uh, was inspired by a particular problem in mass spec imaging. So what we can do is we can create file-based lists of these MZ values and the intensities, and these lists, the individual elements, can be of any length that we want. So here, I'm just going to extract, create a list by extracting the all of the MZ values and create a list by extracting all of the intensities. So this will be a list where each element is a vector of the MZ values or a vector of the intensities. So now if I look at this, for example, this MZ2, this is a matter list. It's a file-based list. And I can extract the elements, and I can see these are the same as what I saw before um, for the act from the actual mass spectra, but the difference is now these have these lists have been written to a file so that they are now stored no longer stored in memory. So now what we can do, we can do the same approach um, <coughs> using EPL apply. I'm just going to iterate over. Um, and some indices of the same length as the number of spectra I have. So length MZ2, so I have 100 mass spectra. I'm going to again give it the list of inten the intensities and the list of MZ values as additional arguments. In my, inside my function, I'm going to subset these lists with the corresponding element that I want to get and turn them into a mass spectrum object and then do my processing. So now I have the results. You can see the output. We still have spectra of totally different lengths, but we were able to set, put, break them to a file and work on them in parallel. I'll plot the first spectrum. You can see it here. And again, that looks like a reasonable result. So that's good. So we can so we can use matter like this to work on um, 
file-based lists if we have a situation where we have a bunch of different vectors, in our case mass spectra, that are different lengths, li different lengths and we can't represent them as a matrix. But I'm going to go one step further than that and suppose that we want to represent this, these, um, these 100 mass spectra as a matrix in some way. Um, so I have this list of mass spectra. I want to be able to work with this list of mass spectra like an ordinary matrix where rows correspond to my mass features, columns correspond to my mass spectra. Um, there's no obvious way to do that without actually going through and binning all of these mass spectra to a common MZ axis. Uh, and so another thing that I have in matter is sparse matrices that can do on the fly binning to some set of common keys. In our case, those keys will be a common list of MZ bins, essentially. So what I'm going to do here now, first I'm going to get the range of all of the MZ ranges in my list of mass spectra. So here, first I'm getting all of the individual ranges from these 100 mass spectra, and then getting the range of these ranges so it gives me the minimum and maximum MZ value across all of these mass spectra. And I'm just going to be really simple about this and create a sequence from the minimum MZ value to the maximum MZ value. And I'm just going to bend these to um, single in unit increments, uh, unit MZ increments. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, what I need to give to this uh, sparse matrix constructor is I need to give it, in order to do, the, do this intelligently, I need to give it a list with uh, two elements. One of them is named keys, the other one is named values. So we can think of these as essentially uh, key value pairs for how to find the row or column elements of this sparse matrix. So the keys that determine which row of the matrix one of the something is, is going to be my MZ values, and the values are going to be the intensities that correspond to those MZ values. And remember MZ2 and intensity2 here are still file-based matrices, these are not in memory, and I need to decide on some kind of binning tolerance, I'm just going to again do something really simple and use a half bin width of 0.5 um, uh, MZ units. So now I'm going to use this sparse mat function. What I give to this is this uh, list um, with keys and values. I'm going to give it a canonical uh, list of keys that are going to be my row keys for the entire matrix. This is the sequence I created in um, unit MZ resolution from the minimum to the maximum uh, MZ values. My tolerance here, so this is going to be my half bin width for the binning them. This sparse matrix is going to do on the fly. And the combiner, by default, this sparse matrix expects to be a normal sparse matrix and just tries to um, assume each key is just a row and uh, there's no binning or anything fancy like that. Um, if I actually want binning to be done, I need to specify a combiner function that specifies um, if I have multiple values that end up in the same bin, how am I going to combine them? I'm going to say I'm going to take the sum. I could also take the mean or the maximum or something like that. And I'm going to put these together into a sparse map that I call intensities 2. And so now this is a 3,766 row matrix with the same uh, 100 number of columns. Um, and each column here will refer to a separate mass spectrum. And we know this originally started with mass, mass spectra that were totally of, of totally different lengths, totally incompatible mass ranges. Um, but this sparse matrix will essentially bin these, all of these key values of MZ values and intensities to a common, um, to this common list of MZ values that I gave as the keys. So. I just look at the keys. These are essentially the row MZ values that will be that everything will be bin to. And I'll just plot the first column here to see that it's something reasonable. And that looks like a reasonable mass spectrum. 
can decide later on you want a different spin width or something like that, but this is good enough to at least show that something reasonable is happening. Um, plot the second mass spectrum and so forth. So this is one way um, that I find useful, at least in, in Cardinal, uh, when working with mass spec imaging and IMZML, um, for working with a bunch of different mass spectra of different lengths, different MZ axes, and working with them as a kind of sparse matrix. Right. Any questions on any of what we covered just now? HDF5 array, matter, any of that? All right, there's no questions. Um, you can always ask me later on, but in the interest of time, I will keep going to our next topic. So the next thing we're going to be talking about is performance, profiling, and debugging in R. So I'm going to, I'm going to go kind of quickly through this next couple of slides since um, the practical use is kind of minimal. But let's uh, think of for a moment about how, how R treats objects that are being modified. So suppose I just create a very simple um, vector. Um, I'm going to call it x. That's uh, random uniform numbers. Uh, I'm going to randomly generate, generate 10 of them, and I'm going to say that I want to replace the fifth element of x with a new value 10. Um, so let's just think about that for a moment. So at this point, I'm going to assign something into x. The question now is what happens to x? How does this update, how does this replacement function actually work? So there are two basic possibilities. One is that x is modified in place. Um, no memory duplication happens. There's no extra copies of x or anything ghostly like that. The other possibility is that r creates a copy of x and modifies that copy. So what do you think happens here? Any ideas? Second one? Any takers for the first one? Everyone is very pessimistic. So everyone thinks it's the second one. Well, the answer is a little bit complicated. The answer is it depends. Um, and in this particular case, it is actually the first one. In this particular case, x is modified in place. But if I had some additional things between uh, those first two lines of code and I did some other things with x, then very likely the pos then very likely the second thing would thing would happen. And we'll just talk very briefly about how that works. So I'm going to load a package called pryr. This just looks at, it helps us look a little bit at some of the R internals and what's going on. So I'm going to, that's not supposed to be one. Uh, it doesn't matter in this case. So I'm going to create a new variable for x. Again, I'm going to call these uh, functions from pryr address and reps. What address does is it just tells us the location in memory where x is stored. Refs tells us um, is r's approximation of the number of names that are pointing to x, the number of variable names that are pointing to x. So the number of references to x um, in R right now. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's close enough. So right now, I assign something to x. It's at this location in memory. Um, there's one variable name that refers to x. I'm going to assign x to y. So let's look at y. Um, y is at this address in memory. Right now, it's the exact same address as x. So this assignment changed uh, essentially nothing. All that changed is that x and y are both pointing to the same location in memory. If I look at the refs of y, I will get 2 now. Because x and y are actually pointing to the same object, which now has two names uh, corresponding to it. So let's look at what happens when we try to assign something into x after we do that. So now I'm going to create a new x again, assign x to y, I'm going to look at the addresses. x and y are in the same locations in memory. I assign something into x now, I look at the locations of x and y. Um, x now has a new location in memory, um, and that is because at this point x does, we do get a copy created of x, and the modification happens on that copy. Uh, y is still in the same place as before, so y remains unmodified. So in this case, when we have both x and y pointing to the same original place in memory, um, here in this case, we do create a copy of x when we attempt to modify it, and 
sometimes a copy is what is actually modified and returned. A useful function that can help us try to track this is a function called trace mem. So here I'm going to again create a new x. I just call this trace mem function on x. This trace mem function is part of base r, not part of, not part of pry r. So you always have access to this trace mem function. Um, here I'm going to assign into x. I don't get any messages because at this point there's only still only one variable uh, pointing to uh, this x location. So at this point, I don't get any messages. The modification is in place. I assign x to y. Now there's two variable names pointing to the same thing. Um, and now if I do an assignment, traceman will give me a message telling me that x has been copied. And if you run this code as an example, um, you have to not run it in our studio. Otherwise, you will get something totally different. Um, running things in our studio, I suppose, is actually less efficient in certain situations because the refs will always be greater than one. Because for our studio's little environment browser here to, uh, to get this part to work, um, it creates additional references to those R objects. So I guess that's one point, one little point against our studio there. So you, have, you would have to run this either on a command line R or using another R GUI that doesn't do that. Okay, so figuring out um, exactly when an object gets duplicated like this gets a little bit more complicated by the fact that using pretty much any function on X will also increment this refs count. So here, for example, I'm gonna create a new X again See, it's at this location in memory, refs is one. Now I'm just going to call a very simple function, identity x. This function just takes x as a parameter and returns x back to you. There's no reason that this should increase the refs count, uh, but it turns out that it does. And in this case, it does so. Um, I mistyped this. This is actually supposed to be x and x here. Um, ignore that this is y and y. This should be x and x. Um, so what actually happens? is if I just do identity x, the refs count does increase. And it does something a little bit weird in the most recent versions of R. It actually goes to 7. Um, you think it would go to 2 or something, it actually goes to 7. And what's actually happening here is this refs, it's not an actual precise reference counting. Um, so what's actually happening here is once I refer to x inside of a function, the refs just increase to the maximum possible value to, to say, the next time you do something with this, uh, absolutely make a copy. Um, it's essentially saying this, treat this as immutable from now on. And it just so happens that the maximum allowed number for this reference count is seven, which is a recent change in the latest R version that I learned from our keynote speaker for today, Gabriel, just last night when I asked him about this. Um, so that's what's happening here, and also why we get this weird increment all the way up to seven. Uh, so, so doing, applying pretty much any function to a variable will increase the refs count and trigger the next time you try to modify it to create a copy. Um, how to avoid that? Um, primitive functions generally won't do this. Primitive functions, again, remember these are in, these essentially go directly into C code. Only core R members can create primitive functions. They know exactly what these primitive functions are doing, so they can do special tricks um, that, so that they know they don't need to increase the ref count. Um, so if I so that's why uh, certain primitive functions, like in this case, the replacement operator for a numeric vector, these can operate on, on a variable without increasing the ref's count. So let's consider a um, simple use case where we just want to modify each column of a data frame in a for loop. Uh, this part, this part, I am going to run again. All right, so I'm going to create a data frame. I'm going to get the medians of all the columns. All I want to do here is subtract off all the medians from all of these columns. Seems straightforward. I'm going to do trace mem on my data frame x, and we'll see what happens. Well, it was pretty fast, so it seems like not something that I should be concerned about. 
Uh, we can see from the output of trace mem that at every single iteration of that for loop, a uh, copy of x was actually created. So why did that happen? Well, this, uh, this bracket operator is not always a primitive function. It's a primitive function when it's applied to certain base R types like integer vectors, character vectors, numeric vectors, matrices, and things like that. Um, but for a data frame, a data frame is just an S3 class. So the bracket operator <coughs> for a data frame is just an ordinary R function, an ordinary R S3 method. Um, and because of that, it will increment the refs count whenever you call it. So that's why this is uh, happening at each iteration. So what we can do is it so happens that if we turn x into a list instead of a data frame and update every element of this list, well, only the, first, only the very first iteration of that loop will create a copy. And the rest of them update the, update the object in place. And this is solely because list is a base R type. So the bracket operator, the replacement operator for a list doesn't increase the refs count. So no additional copies get made. Um, so while we would probably, we generally want to avoid uh, creating a necessarily duplicate objects when we can, but it can be surprisingly difficult to figure out exactly when that happens. Um, this trace mem function is useful in determining that, um, but there's no hard and fast rules. Um, I guess there is, but they're hard to figure out exactly when they apply. Um, so the thing, so the reason that applying any function to a variable increases its refs count typically is because, um, as you, as we talked about the other day, functions in R create closures. They capture their environment. So there's no way of actually knowing if there's still some other variable name pointing to that object somewhere out there in use. Um, so R assumes the worst case scenario and assumes that there is. And as soon, so as soon as we evaluate uh, a parameter in a function, the rest count for that variable, or at least the object in memory that it's pointing to, will be increased. So the exception to this is any functions that do not evaluate their arguments. Um, that's a relatively short list. But if you're using some sort of non-standard evaluation, um, so for example, the substitute function, if you don't know what I'm talking about, ignore this, because most of you probably shouldn't use this. Um, but there are a small list of functions that don't actually evaluate their arguments. Um, and these will also not increment the refs count. So that's probably the extent that I'm going to talk about that, um, mostly because there's, it's hard to figure out when this will happen, so we should use something like TraceMem to try to figure that out. So that's all I'm going to say on that. Any quick final questions? Yes. Does this have significant speed implications if you have a huge data frame? So in that case, you want to convert to a matrix? Yeah. So if if you have a very large object, this can have very significant consequences. So yeah, so updating every column of a data frame, if it has a lot of columns, is going to be inefficient. Um, you would want to, uh, I think the double bracket operator for a data frame might just be calling the list operator since uh, data frames inherit from list, but I'm not sure. So that might be one way around that. Um, but yeah, so working with a base R type or um, something like a matrix, uh, which is basically a base R type just with dimensions, yeah, would get around that. Um, yeah, so that's, it's difficult to figure out how and when this happens, and it's something that you should be thinking about if you're working with a very large object. And that's another nice thing about working with something like a matter matrix or an HDF5 matrix is if you're updating it, well, it's going to be updating whatever is on in that file. Um, it's not going to create additional copies of that. The only part of that that lives in R's memory is just a, a bit of metadata describing where to find that file and so forth. So um, that's another good point uh, for using something like that here. Any other questions? OK, so let's keep going. Um, so let's talk about uh, profiling R code for better performance. And I'm going to be talking here about kind of micro optimization. So we talked about 
sort of macro optimization when we were talking about parallel, uh, parallelism. And so that's when you have a big function that takes a long time to run on a big data set. Here we're going to be talking more about micro optimization when you have some small function that might happen many, many times. So in this case, that would be something like our individual pre-processing functions that we were using. So let's go ahead. Um, I'm going to simulate a um, 100 spectra here again. And I'm going to use a slightly higher mass resolution, not, not high resolution, but higher than the default has been, so that I have a bit more, a few more MC values than before. Um, and I'm just going to plot this, so this is a mass spectrum. And now, so, suppose we want to find the local maxima of a vector, which you can imagine we could use for peak detection. So, right now, our goal is to create a function that finds the local maxima of a vector, and that's something that we might want to do tens, uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of times, or thousands of times, or even millions of times, if we're processing hundreds of thousands of spectra. So we want that little helper function that all it does is calculate the local maxima. We want that thing to be really, really fast. So I'm going to start off with this initial version that one might conceivably write as the first version of this function. Who wants to volunteer to kind of walk me through what this function is doing? You already know what the output is supposed to be, the indices of peaks, or local, uh, the indices of local maxima. Does anyone want to take a stab at taking us through this line by line? Any takers? All right, so let's go through it line by line. So we have um, x is going to be some sort of numeric vector. Um, we're going to give this a half window. So what this local maxima function is going to do, it's going to do something really simple. It's just going to use a sliding window across the entire vector and see um, if the center data point that it's looking at in the center of that window, are there any other data points in that window that are larger than that data point? If there are, it's not a maxima. If it's the highest uh, point in that particular window, we're going to say that it's a local maxima. Um, really simple, uh, so it's, so, but a reasonable thing to do. So we have a half window. We're going to set up where we want to start looking in our vector. So we're going to create a beginning in this index and an ending index. So the first point that we're going to look at is going to be uh, one plus that half window. Uh, the last data point in the vector we're going to look at is going to be the length of the vector minus that half window. And we're going to create this out parameter that we're going to initialize as just a length zero integer. And well, firstly, if either of this beginning or ending is not, uh, if the beginning is less than one or the end is greater than the length, so essentially this will happen if our, if our numeric vector is smaller than our, than our window allows, we're just going to return an empty integer. So now we're going to loop through the first index there down to the last index um, in terms of that beginning and end. We're going to calculate uh, an index for the beginning of our window and the ending of our window. I'm just going to create a logical uh, length one scalar or length one vector. That's a, a logical scalar, I guess. Um, that says, is this a, max, a local maximum? It's going to default to true. Then I'm going to look at all of the data points inside that window. If I find any that are larger than that center point, I'm going to say it is not a local maxima. And that's going to be good enough to, to detect my local maxima. Um, if it is a local maxima, after examining all of those data points, I'm going to append that new index to my out uh, parameter. And I'm going to return it out, which is just the integer indices of anything that is a local maxima. Seem re seems reasonable? Okay. So, well, first, I guess I should see if something like this actually works. I guess you shouldn't take my word for it. So, I'll create that function. Um, I'll come up with something really simple. Something really simple. 
Uh, that gives me weird output. Um, maybe there's something wrong. Oh, so what's actually happening here? And so this is, I'm going to say this is going to be good enough for our testing purposes, but this is something that you would want to uh, check in a production version of this. So what's happening here is, well, can anyone spot what's happening and tell me? And, yep. Right, so if I have a window and everything in that window is the same value, well, nothing in that window is going to be larger than that center data point, and so it's going to erroneously say that that's a local maximum. So I would want this logic to be a little bit more complicated um, to check for things like that. Uh, I simplified this from a version that I have in Cardinal that actually does do that checking. I took it out just so that this would fit on a slide and be easy to read. Um, in the case of the mass spectra we'll be testing this on, they're all going to be um, doubles rather than integers, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. I'm going to assume that the mass spectrum is going to be smooth enough that we're not just going to have a long vector of zeros. All right. And at least I looked at the my find peaks function which returned reasonable results, so I'm not going to worry about it right now. Uh, that's a homework for you. Add some additional logic to this uh, function to check for that situation. <laughs> OK, but so to keep going, uh, let's try to benchmark this function and see how fast it is. So there's a library, uh, there's a package called microbenchmark um, that is designed for exactly this purpose. Um, it's useful for accurately benchmarking the uh, small little functions like this that are going to end up being called many, many, many times. So you want them to be really, really fast. Uh, the reason we can't use or don't or shouldn't use the built-in system dot time function that I was using before is because these this kind this kind of function is designed to be so quick that system dot time isn't really going to give us uh, accurate results. We're going to want to do this many many times and then average the the timings together because there are, the amount of time something that something like this takes will be a little bit different from each time we do it. So we're going to average together. Something like a hundred, uh, something like a hundred uh, timings for this. Okay. All right. So here I'm just calling micro benchmark uh, log max one on the intensities of uh, the first mass spectrum here. Um, by default, it does this uh, 100 times, and it reports uh, the distribution of these. So we have the minimum amount of time, the maximum amount of, amount of time, the mean amount of time, and this, this, this the distribution of these times, there will typically be outliers, so we usually want to pay attention to the median here. Uh, so on average, this took about 9.7 milliseconds. That seems okay, but the question now is, can we do better? <coughs> so we're going to profile this code with a function called rprof. rprof is rprof comes with base r. It's just part of the utils package that comes with base r. Um, how rprof works is we just um, call rprof that starts r's profiler, um, runs some amount of code. And then we do rprof of null to turn off the profiler. And then that, um, while R is doing this profiling, it will um, essentially uh, take, at certain intervals, it will uh, sample and check what function is currently being called. And it will write that to a file. So essentially what we'll have is a file with a bunch of different samples. And the samples just tell us what function is currently being evaluated. So to um, get a decent profiling uh, from this, we need to ha run this on something that takes a decent amount of time because we're re relying on this sampling thing. Um, we can control the sampling interval with interval here. Um, that's in seconds. And again, I want this to take a little bit longer than, than 100, than, what was it? 
a little bit longer than 9.7 milliseconds because I want enough data. So I'm just going to SFY and do load max to all of my 100 spec right here. There is a function called summary rprof that will summarize the results. So if I look here, this file called rprof.out gets created in my working directory. You could also specify a path to the file. And you can see it's just a bunch of data from what function is currently being evaluated. So it's, let's use summary rprof. So this essentially summarizes how much time is spent inside of each function. And I'm going to pay attention mostly to this, uh, these three functions up at the top. Uh, so most of the time was spent in loc max one, that's to be expected. Um, a small amount of time was spent doing length for some reason. Uh, but then a lot of time was spent on this uh, C function. And the C function is what we use, of course, to create vectors. In this case, what I'm using to combine my existing uh, integer vector of peak indices with any new peak index that I detect. So this C function seems to be taking a lot of time. Um, and that's, of course, because I'm, I have a numeric vector. And if I want to append to it, I'm going to have to create a whole new numeric vector um, and that significantly slows it down. Uh, Barrett mentioned uh, the profviz uh, package yesterday. Uh, profviz also uses rprof, um, so it does the exact same profiling, but it gives us a neat little visualization of the output uh, so you can explore what is being done here. Um, I'm actually not the best at interpreting this visualization, I can see um, how much time certain things took. I don't know, look up, look up the documentation for this function and how to interpret the visualization. But it's a, it's a good thing to be aware of and it provides a nice little visualization for this R profiling. Uh, really this function is kind of too fast for profiling to be of much use, so uh, the results won't always be the best. Another thing is because it's this profiling is relying on sampling. Your results, what the profiling looks like, will vary a little bit each time you run it. Um, and because this function is already pretty fast, um, the results will vary, could vary quite a lot. Um, so ideally, I might want to create a very, very, very large um, vector or something and try to run this on something that would take a little bit more time to get a better idea. OK, so I'm going to. So let's uh, do some, um, let's change this function to try to account for what we just learned. So let's not uh, append a new, a new number to, a, to a new, or an integer vector in this case. Instead, what we'll do here is we will create a logical vector of the length of x initially, and then in this for loop, we will assign into that integer vector that is already of the correct length so that we're not appending stuff to it. And because out here is a logical vector, um, which is a base R type, and it's a uh, bracketed assignment operator, is a primitive function. Uh, as we just learned, this will modify this uh, vector in place. So this should ideally be much more efficient. Um, so the main thing we're doing here is we're getting rid of that C function that's doing concatenation. We're initializing the vector of the proper length beforehand and um, hopefully modifying it in place instead. Uh, and then we're just going to call which on this to get the indices of the local maximum. So this is version two. 
Uh, I wrote one additional version, this is version three. So um, my thought was, well, in R, we typically want to try to vectorize things. Usually the main reason that things are slow in R is because we're doing something in a for loop or something, rather than taking advantage of um, something that is already vectorized. Um, so here I'm going to try to write this in a little bit maybe more in an idiomatic R way. So instead of doing a for loop like this, what I'm going to do is use v apply. So v apply is just a slightly more efficient version of s apply or l apply, where I have to specify the return type. Um, that allows v apply to be a little bit more efficient because it can pre-initialize the result just like I did in version two here. Um, so I'm just going to do v apply over these indices um, again to get to the window that I'm looking at. And I'm going to vectorize this comparison as well. So I'm going to index the portion of x that is my window, see if any of those um, are greater than my center point. That's going to give me a logical vector, and I'm going to use any, which is, a, again, a vectorized function that will tell me if any of those are true. If any of those are true, I'll say false. This is not a peak. Otherwise, true, it is a peak. V applied will return to me a logical vector. And now I need to pad the ends with the um, a few additional um, falses to correspond to the half windows that were cut off. And then I'll just return uh, the indices using which. Okay, so we have two versions. Um, let's make sure that they output the same things. So that's usually a good thing to do when you're trying to optimize a function, make sure that you're actually doing the same thing. Uh, in our case, we actually already know we're doing something slightly wrong, but let's at least make sure we're doing the same wrong thing both times. So we're just going to use all equal to make sure that the output of these all match up. Um, they do, so that means we're good to go, and we can at least compare these functions knowing we're doing the same thing. So now, my question to you is, which of these three functions will be the fastest? Who votes for one? Two. Three? Like three people voted, come on. <laughs> One, two, couple, three. All right, so three seems to be the consensus on what we think. Um, let's see, I'll go ahead and do this interactively. Let's create look max two. Let's create look max three. Verify these are all doing the same thing. And now my for benchmark, and see that most people didn't look ahead in my slides because a lot of people got it wrong. <laughs> so uh, the second version here is actually the fastest, and the third version where I use more idiomatic R like v apply and a vectorized function like any is actually the slowest by far in this case. So the popular perception of how things work in R are sometimes completely wrong. Um, for loops are, as it turns out, not inherently slower than functions like L apply and V apply and so forth. So here, version two, we're able to update that local maxim in place. We're able to exit the for, that inner for loop as soon as we know something's not a peak, and I suppose that makes it a bit faster than V apply, even though that vectorized stuff is vectorized and efficient. We're still looking at more data points than version two is. Um, and the for loop is actually pretty efficient. So here, our best version of this function was loc max two. Yes. Is it kind of because you're not copying objects in the for loop. Uh, we. It, it would be slower if you were copying an object. Right. So that would be the main difference from the initial version. So in version one. Whenever we uh, append the new peak to this list, to this integer vector of peaks, that will create a copy. Um, so that's definitely what's slowing down version one the most. Um, version two, we're avoiding that, so we shouldn't be making any, any additional copies. Uh, version three, at, at least, we're not actually any, there, we shouldn't be making any copies ourselves. Um, V apply will be getting shouldn't shouldn't be either, so I'm not entirely sure quite what's making it so much slower than the other versions. I would think it should at least be faster than version one, so I'm not entirely sure why. I guess V apply has some amount of overhead to it, 
Um, that's making it a little bit slower in this case. Um, I could conceivably try this on much uh, larger mass spectra with much higher resolution and see if that changes the results. Um, but in this case, version two seems to be the fastest. Any questions to this point? Yeah, so definitely do not believe um, what you think to be, what you believe is true uh, about your code. Do not believe what people say on the internet. Actually time things to make sure what you think should be the fastest is actually the fastest. Um, there, are that, there are actually numerous times that I have uh, tried to optimize some small function like this, thinking that I was improving it, but then when I actually went to benchmark it, the new version was actually slower. Um, and so I just used the version, the initial version that I thought should be, I could be, I should be able to improve it, but was already fast, uh, faster than anything I could try to do to improve it. So that is the lesson here. Okay, so what about, um, at this point, we've probably kind of exhausted the amount of optimization that we can do in R itself. Um, so once you get to that point, uh, if you're, if you still want some additional speed, uh, that's kind of the point that you might want to start thinking about um, calling something in C or C++ rather than just R code. So fortunately, it's pretty easy to call C++ code or C code from R. Um, the RCDP package makes it really easy. Um, so here we're going to look at how we can uh, incorporate C++ code to make this really, really fast. So here I'm just going to load the RCDP library, show you a very basic example from RCDP. So here, um, RCDP actually allows me to just compile a, a function from the R command line, from the R console here. So I'll load RCDP, create a very simple Function. So I have an R version called add one. All it does is it takes something and adds one to it. Um, create a C function that does uh, the exact same thing. And compile it with a CPP function from the RCPP package. Uh, you can see if I look at these, well, add one is just an ordinary R function. Add one C is a function that uh, calls this uh, dot call function, which has this uh, pointer thing to it, and then this thing gets uh, the argument x. So let's make sure these are doing the same thing. They're both adding one to whatever I give to it. That seems good. Is that what C right away? Um, in this case, it is not because I have this set up to just be a double. Um, RCPP is very nice about it, that RCPP actually has a lot of syntactic sugar inside it, so I believe this should just work and be vectorized already. If all I do is change these doubles to numeric vectors, uh, maybe not. Oh, I edited the wrong thing there. Let's try that again. You can see that it is actually compiling this function. Uh, take a look at these. So add one to two, add one to two again. Let's try adding one to vector one through 10. This might actually fail because one through 10 is an integer. Oh, looks like it automatically forces it to a numeric vector for me as well. That's really nice. Uh, yeah, so you can see all I had to change there was just change double to numeric vector and RCPP makes it really nice. Uh, that just works. <laughs> yeah, it should be nicer than Fortran. <laughs> okay, so now let's create an RCPP version of our function. Uh, you can see this looks a lot like what we had before, so it's not that difficult to, to understand what's going on here. So RCDP gives us these uh, C++ classes that are basically wrappers of these R objects. So I can just, uh, I just have a numeric vector here, x, an integer for a half window, and this is a C++ function that returns a logical vector. I'm gonna create 
I'm going to initialize a new logical vector of the same length as x. If you're familiar with C++ programming, you can see x is an object here. I'm calling the length method on it to get the length of x. And then I'm going to loop through um, 1 equals the half window um, through i is less than uh, the length of x minus the half window. I'm going to set is max is look max equal to true. I'm going to do my little inner loop here through the window. Uh, set it to false if I find anything bigger than the xi. Um, and then I'm going to return my logical vector is look max. So I happen to have this in this folder as this R, R, C, or this C++ file here. I need to change my working directory to so I can find it. All right. So now I can uh, source and compile a C++ file using RCPP, just using source CPP. Um, say verbose equals interactive. I'm in an interactive R session, so this will be true. Uh, so I can get that compiler uh, output so I can see what's going on. Compile pretty quickly. It's a pretty simple function. And so one thing uh, that I didn't do, so this is look max. This is returning a logical vector. So I'm just going to write a little uh, wrapper function. Oops. Uh, well, firstly, source CPP, source CPP here. It created a, an R function that um, calls this C++ code. It created this R function for me. Um, I'm going to create another little wrapper function around this that calls which on the output of this. So I'm returning the, um, uh, the vector indices just like my other, uh, just like my other low max function would do. And now I'm Now I'm going to verify this also is doing the same thing as my previous functions. And let's benchmark uh, this now. I guess I should have asked you which one you think will be faster first again. But I think in this case it will be pretty obvious that uh, the C++ code um, outperforms the interpreted code any day. So that was really easy. Um, so in, in our case, uh, Act getting a C++ uh, code into R from RCPP as simple as just doing this source uh, CPP. Uh, using RCPP in a package is also relatively uh, simple. So in the description file, you just need to add uh, that it's linking to RCPP, that it's importing RCPP, and then in the namespace or in your oxygen code comments, um, you have this use dynlib um, that is saying that you're your package is calling some dynamic library um, of compiled code, and you also need to import the RCP package. So RCPP also comes with its own version of package uh, skeleton that we used earlier on to kind of create a skeleton R package directory that we can then edit. So R package skeleton here sets up most of the um, stuff that you need to create a package with RCPP. So I'm going to take a look at it here. So I just ran this rcpp.package.skeleton and it created this uh, new package folder for me. You can see it has a, um, it starts, it gives you a very simple hello world example with an example RCPP function. Uh, it also creates this RCPP exports thing. So this is something that you don't edit by hand, kind of like Roxygen, uh, kind of like Roxygen 2. There's some stuff that you don't edit by hand um, because RCPP will generate the kind of dirty uh, code that you don't need to worry about because you're using RCPP. Uh, you can see this is linking to RCPP. Uh, namespace, it's importing from RCPP and you're using this dynamic library. So, Pretty straightforward, and you could just um, use this as a template and edit it and create your functions as however you like. Um, so, 
once you are doing that, so you do need to kind of, again, kind of like Rockstrin2, you would need to use this RCDP function called compile attributes. Um, this doesn't actually compile your code, it just generates uh, the code so that R is able to talk to your C++ function and compile that correctly when you actually do compile your code, which will happen whenever you build and install the package. Uh, so using C or C++ in an R package, RCTT is probably the easiest way to include C++ in your R package. It has a lot of community support now. It's very stable now. Um, you can check out the RCTT website for a lot more information. They have a whole book on writing RCTT, so you can see all of those um, numeric vector, integer vector, logical vector, all those classes that are available to you, as well as lots of the syntactic sugar that RCTP supplies for you. So we saw earlier on, uh, the question was, was this automatically vectorized? And RCTP uh, has uh, methods so that it actually is, so you can write something that actually looks a lot like our code and RCTP takes care of uh, a lot of the nitty-gritty things for you. Both of your examples, you were doing the same thing the same number of times in each element in the vector. Yep. If you were dealing with a convergence criteria, it would be different for each element. Is there anything that simplifies that in our system? Um, I don't, uh, so are you asking if there's like anything that I'm understanding you correctly. I don't think that there's anything that ought, that would automatically do anything like that in RCDP. So it still kind of depends on your own. You still have to write some some amount of code and your own logic. Um, it will. There are some things that will automatically be vectorized and things like that. So you can do vectorized addition, multiplication, and stuff of uh, numeric vectors and stuff. Um, the rest is just uh, ordinary C++ code, so however you would write an ordinary C++ function is how you would do it. Uh, so that's RCPP. You can also use the native .call framework, which is what RCPP um, generates uh, templates for under the hood. Um, the .call framework uh, is kind of the the native way that you get with base R for calling C or C++ code from R. It requires some knowledge of the R internals because you're essentially working with the internal um, R functions for working with R objects. Um, you want to do this looking at the R source code and in particular the header file rinternals.h is very helpful. Um, and there's a lot more information on this in the writing R extensions manual by R core. Um, and I actually have branches of MS example that use uh, both RCPP uh, as well as the native dot call framework if you want to see what the differences would be. So I'm going to switch over here, show you. So this is the commit where I added uh, RCPP, the, an RCPP version of this load max function to this example package. You can see imports RCPP, added a use dynamic library, import RCPP. Um, there's a new fu uh, file added, and this is one of the ones that is generated automatically by RCPP when you use that compile attributes function. is not as interesting. So here is my actual uh, wrapper function that calls the RCPP code. And then the interesting part here, actually not that part, that part is also generated by RCPP automatically. So I didn't write this. This part is also generated by RCPP. Here is the part um, that I wrote as just the same um, RCPP function uh, that we just worked on. So you can look at that to see exactly how you would integrate RCPP code into this package. 
and if you want to see how you would write this if you were a masochist like me and used the dot call framework uh, itself. So here in my source directory, you can see I have a few files. Um, first one, I created a C header file um, that just declared that it includes um, r.h header and r internals.h. Um, r internals is what let, gives me access to all of the internal, well, a lot of the internal R functions. I happen to have the R 3.6 source code right here. So the way, the place you would find this is in uh, source include R internals dot H. So this is from the R source code. Um, so I have access to a bunch of functions and macros from here for things like. Allocating a vector, checking if something's an array or a matrix. It creates uh, some macros of other functions for allocating an array, parsing to logicals, integers, um, things like that. So, what this function actually looks like is this, which is a C code that is working with these R internals. I'm including my little header file that declares this C load max function, um, importing uh, or including the standard C, C library for that gives me booleans. Uh, everything in in R is in C in C is an SEXP object. Um, you have to work with these in a particular way. Um, you can see if I want to create a new object, so here I'm in, um, allocating a logical vector um, because of R's gar garbage collector, I have to protect that from the garbage collector. Um, I have to get a C pointer to the numeric, to the um, actual data of this. X here is going to be my numeric vector. And C is just an SEXP. I happen I have to know it's a numeric vector and use real to get a pointer to the actual data. Um, and then before returning this, I have to unprotect uh, what I protected from the garbage collection. So I'm not going to go more into that right now, but you can look at it if you if you want. Uh, any general questions on any of that? C R C D P is equals plus. Yes. Um, one less dependency in your R package, which in my opinion is not insignificant. Um, personally, I, I think that you should try to keep the number of things that, uh, the number of other packages you depend on to a minimum. So if, depending on how, ex uh, how extensive your C++ code is and how helpful RCPP is, um, you might consider not depending on, on RCPP. Personally, a lot of the C code that I write isn't, doesn't actually benefit very much from RCPP just because, like with Matter, I'm working at a very low level um, with um, just reading stuff from files and oh, I have a lot of C++ code for handling that. RCPP itself doesn't help me with that in any way because all of that is before I even put it into an R object. Um, so I didn't bother with a dependency on RCPP for that. For most people, if you're going to be working with R objects in your C++ code, which is what a lot of people are going to be doing, um, then, it, then you probably want to use RCPP because it makes so many of those things much easier. Um, but there are people like me, for example, who don't get as much out of it because a lot of the C++ code I write doesn't actually, 
work with bar objects until I want to return it to you. Uh, and, uh, performance, you will notice some very minor differences that are not that are not probably not real. Um, ultimately, our CPP is using the, is using this dot call framework. It's just generating the the ugly parts for you. Um, all of this numeric vector, integer vector, logical vector. These are just nice um, C++ class templates that are wrapping the internal R stuff. So ultimately, you're running the exact not the exact same code, but you're using the same infrastructure um, in both cases. RCPP, RCPP just makes it much easier to do so. So there shouldn't be any major performance differences, except maybe the different some differences being like RCPP gives you lots of stuff for free, like that vector uh, vectorized addition and multiplication and stuff that Maybe conceivably, if you coded it yourself, you might not do it as efficiently or something like that. So though you might have performance differences there. Um, but I wouldn't worry. <laughs> Once you're going into C and C++, any differences between between those, would um, I wouldn't worry about. Um, yeah, so I would primarily just think about what it saves you in terms of developer time. Um, and in most cases, RCDP will be what most people would want to use. Any other questions? Okay, so um, we're about to uh, wrap up uh, and have a break. Um, I'm just going to show you, uh, without really walking through some of this, uh, I guess, um, how many of you have used R as debugger? A couple. So for those of you who are not aware, R has a debugger that is uh, very simple to initialize. Um, the simplest way to do that is just add a call to browser somewhere inside the function. Um, so here I got a call added a call to browser to load max three here. So if I call this on so if I try to use load max three you can see as soon as I hit wherever that browser was it'll throw me into this debugger um, where I can step through the code of the function line by line. Um, there are certain commands here, um, such as going to the next line, stepping into the next line, if the next line is a function that then calls some stuff. Um, this is one way of accessing this debugger. To do this, you actually have to have the source code, of course, because you need to be able to add this line, um, this, this line of code browser somewhere. Um, if you do not have access to that source code, there's two other ways to do this um, that in many cases will be easier. Uh, firstly, there's this options error equals recover thing. And what this means is uh, whenever R encounters an error, by default it will just stop executing and tell you about the error. You can instead provide error equals recover, and this means that when R runs into an error, it will give you the current stack, and you can enter jump into any function on that stack in the debugger and try to figure out what went wrong. So that's a useful thing um, if you are if you have some error that you're trying to debug. Um, another thing is you can use this debug function. You just give this debug function the name of a function. So in this case, here we put out of this, I'm going to debug loaf max two. Um, so right now I had added uh, the browser <coughs> to load max three, I think. Sorry, I had added it at one point. I got rid of it, I guess. Um, so anyway, I am going to debug load max two here. So that means whenever load max two gets called. Um, it will also enter this debugger, enter this browser. So that's a way to um, trigger this debugger when you don't have the source code. You can call this on any function. Um, and then you just undebug that function once you're done. Um, uh, one note that I will make if you're trying to debug an S4 method, um, since we talked about S4 classes and methods, and if you're creating a bioconductor package, you'll probably have some of these. These are a little bit more difficult to debug. 
because if you use debug on the generic function, you will only end up debugging the generic function, which is not useful at all because it doesn't actually call any meaningful code. Um, there is a argument to debug called signature, and this is how you specify what S4 method you actually want to debug. So here I'm giving, you know, I want to debug plot. I don't want to debug the plot generic function. So I'm going to give a signature of mass spectrum missing. So that means I'm going to be de debugging uh, my plot method for mass spectrum and missing. So that will let you use this debug function with an S4 method, which is really useful. If you don't know that, it's a pain to try to debug an S4 method. Um, we didn't have time to talk about this, but uh, as a um, exercise, again, for homework, uh, there are some unit tests already in the MS example package. Um, you should write some new unit tests for the log max function. Uh, it's a good practice to write some unit tests. So right now, if you so if you've already debugged a function, you, you can always check if it breaks again. Um, vignettes again are useful. This is something we mentioned before. Um, it's good to have a vignette as a uh, walkthrough for new users so they know how to use your package. Another really useful thing about vignettes is unit tests can only test really small things. They're usually testing one specific function each. Uh, vignettes, while not exactly a test, um, gives you a way where you gives you a place where you're presumably running all kind all of your functions um, and use and using some sort of realistic uh, workflow where you're using most of the most of the functions in your package. So you can then check the vignette output to make sure that all of your output is still reasonable. Whenever you make a change, you can rebuild the vignette and check it make sure the output is the same. So that's so vignettes also serve as a reasonably good, good way to kind of uh, do a systems or integration test of your package. All right, um, so I'm about to let you go for refreshments. Sorry, we went a couple minutes over time. Um, any final thoughts or questions? If not, you can find me during the break or after we're all done with everything. So let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, grab some refreshments, and then we'll come back for our final keynote.